For some analysis on this matter, we are now joined by international defense and counterterrorism consultant David Otto. Mr. Otto, very good evening to you. It's always a pleasure having you join us on the globe. Uh, thanks indeed for being a part of the show. Uh, first of all, what in your view does the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan mean for Africa's jihadist movements? I mean, the, the, the Taliban has made assurances that Afghanistan won't be a haven for militants. Are you at all convinced? I mean, what we have to really understand uh, is that we have to be very clear that uh, the, the Taliban used to be a full-fledged state recognized by the international community and the UN uh, before they were taken out of uh, power, removed by the US, uh, accusing them, rightly so, of shielding al-Qaeda. So um, even though the Taliban uh, was shielding al-Qaeda, it was not um, a terrorist organization. So um, any... Uh, terrorist organization that wants to compare itself um, with the Taliban, you know, will have to do much more than what they are currently doing. Um, and you rightly said uh, that, you know, the Taliban has promised um, very strongly that, indeed, uh, they, they will not allow al-Qaeda um, into Afghanistan. But this is very, very difficult, you know, for anyone to believe, because, uh, as you rightly know, the time when the Taliban became an insurgency movement uh, between 2001 and up to the time uh, when they've walked into Kabul uh, 20 years later, the Taliban has been fighting, you know, side by side with Al Qaeda. Uh, they also have a very strong network uh, with the Haqqani uh, network, which is also a terrorist group based in Afghanistan. Now, the only group that the Taliban doesn't get along with is the Islamic State of the Khorasan province, you know, which is, you know, part of the ISIS affiliate. But one of the things which everyone talks about, and which, you know, everyone should be worried about is, you know, how will the Taliban be able uh, to distance itself from al-Qaeda, you know, even though, you know, they've been fighting a common enemy, which is the U.S. and NATO coalition for the past 20 years. So nobody really knows, but African countries shouldn't really um, bother much about, you know, all the jihadists, you know, claiming to send appreciation or congratulatory messages to the Taliban. Now, the Taliban, you know, will have to do something else unless, you know, they don't have the opportunity uh, to consolidate power. And if there is chaos in Afghanistan, that is when we would have terrorist organizations taking advantage of the vacuum. Do you think the Taliban takeover has enough propensity, uh, you know, to inspire jihadist movements in Africa? Again, you know, um, each case is very different. The Taliban case is one of a government that was taken out of power and then coming back uh, to take back power. So, you know, um, the, the cases, for example, uh, you know, before Boko Haram became what it is, uh, the movement used to call itself the Nigerian Taliban. That was in 2001 and then metamorphosed into al-Qaeda's affiliate uh, with the al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, then pledged allegiance to al-Qaeda core, which, of course, has been a very close, um, in very close um, operational relationship with the Taliban. Uh, but, of course, you know, that then led to the Islamic State of West Africa province. All these um, various organizations that exist, you mentioned in Mozambique, ISIS affiliate there. We've got al-Qaeda affiliates in the Sahel, we have them in uh, ISIS affiliate in the Central African Republic, um, close to uh, DRC Congo as well. So I don't think, um, you know, there can be a replication of, of what uh, the Taliban has done, uh, because again, you know, that's, you know, a legitimate state, you know, before 2001. Even, um, you know, groups like Al-Shabaab, Al which has a huge support and uh, influencing the, the process of elections in, in Somalia at this point, do not have that capacity, you know, to replicate what the Taliban has done. But what they do have is should the Taliban, you know, fail to consolidate power, as we have seen um, some resistance movement coming from the Pangji Valley, led by, you know, the infamous, um, uh, the, the famous uh, Ahmad Massoud, who used to fight against the Taliban. Uh, I think you remember his father, um, Ahmad Shah Massoud. Yes. If this resistance succeeds, you know, I have to mention that, if this resistance succeeds, and Afghanistan becomes, you know, destabilized, you know, the Taliban can't consolidate, um, you know, their hold on the country, then we could see uh, Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups in Africa benefiting directly from that. 
Now, some analysts have pointed out, uh, Mr. David Otto, that the groups fighting in West Africa uh, are not a cohesive force like the Taliban, but a mixture of various militias instead. Do you think that's uh, an accurate assessment? Would you concur with those sentiments? I think that's inaccurate. Um, the Taliban, again, you know, was in charge of Afghanistan. There is no other terrorist group in Africa, be it in Nigeria, that has the same capacity. Uh, Boko Haram claims... Uh, to have taken Nigerian territory. That was in 2014, before uh, the, the uh, President Muhammad Buhari's uh, government came into power. I mean, they held one of their headquarters in, in Goza. Um, but, you know, in 2015, when Nigerian uh, president came to power, you know, uh, there was this general who, uh, I think the, the, the previous um, general, Lieutenant General Tuku Buratai, who brought in a strategy and, and took over the territory that Boko Haram had. Um, so Boko Haram doesn't have that kind of capacity. They don't control uh, the kind of territory that you see um, the, the Taliban controls. Uh, of course, you know, there's so many people saying, oh, they have, they've got control of land and all, and all that. But they don't control any of the 774 local government areas. Even Al-Shabaab, you know, has presence, which shouldn't be confused, you know, with control of territory. So none of the African, you know, terrorist groups have that kind of capacity to overrun the entire government and then, you know, sit cross-legged in, in, in the presidential palace and make announcements. They don't have that. But what they do have is the ability to cause a nuisance, you know, to make sure that um, in areas where they have presence, you know, there is no peace and there is no stability. Well, the Nigerian president, Muhammadu Buhari, suggested this week that the war on terror is not over, but is now moving to Africa. Uh, Nigeria itself, remember, has been fighting Boko Haram since 2009, and that conflict has spread to areas in Cameroon, uh, in Chad and Niger. Is Africa fertile ground for, you know, for terrorism? Uh, it is a fertile ground, uh, because most African countries do not have a, a very effective counter-terrorism strategy. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, Nigeria has been engaging Boko Haram since 2009. But again, um, remember that the Nigerian Taliban began in 2001, the same time when we had 9-11, the same time when we had the United States launching a preemptive strike against Afghanistan. So you've got these groups spreading across uh, the boundaries uh, which are very porous, you know, in Cameroon. Why did they do that? because they were driven away by the Nigerian army, which was, you know, um, you know, sent to this northern part of the country. And then there was a civilian joint task force, which was a local um, militia that, you know, was used to push back uh, the terrorists towards the, the boundary regions. So, um, you know, now all these other countries have come in into, you know, somehow, you know, having these terrorist organizations operating. Cameroon is one of them in the northern part. But you need an effective strategy. Multinational joint tax force, which has been initiated, you know, since 2012, you know, is very weak. You know, there is no coordination between Cameroon and Nigeria, Cameroon and, and Chad, you know, Cameroon and Niger, and vice versa. So you need that. In the Sahel, it is the same thing. There is a much concern, um, I have to say, uh, that in areas in, in, in northern uh, Mali, you know, the Azawad, you know, which was, you know, clamoring for its independence uh, since 2013, you know, uh, they are saying that, you know, they may have some links uh, with all these jihadist networks and someday declare their independence. But that's a very different ballgame. We've got to take that into context. But I don't see any terrorist group again in Africa doing what the Taliban has done or calling for the Taliban to, you know, come to their assistance, unless the Taliban becomes really frustrated and they cannot rule Afghanistan then they will go for everybody loses. And this is where the problem would be. Why is this the case, though, Mr. Otto? I mean, why is Africa a potential breeding ground for terrorist activities? And why is it fertile ground for these uh, jihadist networks to, to strive? Uh, I mean, the, the, the big question, perhaps, is what are some of the pull factors that entice these, uh, you know, terrorist movements to operate in Africa? I think the key ones that everybody talks about is, is poverty and unemployment. But, mm -hmm. you know, not all unemployed people join terrorist organizations and, and rich people also, you know, belong to terrorist groups. So you've got to look beyond that. Um, I think it's an issue of, you know, space. Most terrorist organizations, they look for areas which are very porous, where governance is weak, where there is little resistance in terms of strategy. But of course, they then take advantage 
of you know um, this you know, relative deprivation, I call it, not actually poverty, but people that are looking for some sense of belonging, people that uh, believe that a terrorist organization is, is the best of two options or the best of one option that they do have. Okay. So it's, it's not just one factor. I have, to, I have to mention, there are so many reasons why people join terrorist organizations besides being poor or being unemployed. Um, you've got to look at the individual dynamics. But I think what African governments need to do is to do what you call the fear of elimination. They've got to remove uh, those very simple uh, keep the push and pull factors like you know, unemployment. But how can they do that? It's, it's all collaboration. And it takes a long time to do that, not military alone. We've learned from lessons you know, in Afghanistan. And some of these Islamist leaders have drawn comparisons between the withdrawal of foreign troops in Afghanistan and France's decision to reduce its military presence in West Africa's Sahel region. Are such withdrawals an admission of failure on the part of the Western powers, perhaps, uh, thus providing a psychological boost for the Islamist groups? Uh, very different in context. Um, if you go to, for example, in the Sahel and Mali, and, and you talk to stakeholders within that area, they tell you that the presence of France, you know, has caused more problems. You know, it's led to militias being supported left, right, and center. Uh, since uh, France deployed Operation Bakken in 2012, there has been an increase in terrorist and jihadist or insurgency groups within that region. That hasn't succeeded. So in the case of the Sahel, if these the stakeholders who were saying, we don't want you there, you should leave. Now, if you parallel that with what is going on in Afghanistan, the U.S. went there for two things. One, eliminate al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden and, you know, punish the Afghanistan government, which was a Taliban government at the time. Now, the reason why this became a lot more complicated was because the U.S. then, while they were in Afghanistan, thought, OK, why not? You know, let's see if we can change the regime. Let's see if we can, you know, reestablish some kind of a, a reconstruction, bring in democracy and get away with the, you know, the archaic, they call it, um, Islamic uh, system of governance. Okay. Now, this is where the problem was and is, you know, with Afghanistan and in comparison to areas like the Chad. Now, the U.S. did succeed, of course, in destabilizing the, the Taliban government. They did succeed in reducing the capacity. They did not succeed to eliminate al-Qaeda, of course. They killed Osama bin Laden. But... What they did not succeed to do was to change the regime. And this is where we are today with Afghanistan. The Taliban are back, and we have to find ways, governments have to find ways, people have to find ways of seeing how they can leverage it. Else, if they become destabilized, the entire world, including Africa, you know, will have you know, um, huge ramifications as a result of that. And speaking of uh, governments finding ways to leverage themselves, I mean, should African governments then who are heavily reliant on foreign support be worried about these developments? I mean, uh, what counterinsurgency measures should they be putting in place uh, should such movements gain maximum traction? I think there is one immediate one. Uh, African governments have to watch very closely um, how the Taliban comeback is being, you know, um, dealt with by the Western states. And this is where stability comes in. Now, I've seen a lot of African countries, i.e. Uganda, um, you know, taking a lot of refugees, you know, that are coming from Afghanistan. Now, another thing which African countries have to be really careful about is who do you bring into your country? Yes. Now, uh, there are talks of, you know, this is a temporary measure. Um, but something that is temporary, we, we talk of, you know, the U.S. said they'll be in Afghanistan for less than three months or six months, and then 20 years later, they're still there. So African countries have to be very careful uh, in terms of refugees that are living from Afghanistan. Who are they? Um, this is not to say they shouldn't be benevolent in terms of, you know, taking in refugees, because, of course, you know, there are horrible um, instances where, you know, countries need to help. But they have to be careful about that. Uh, but also, African countries have to learn to develop their own strategy and develop their own defense mechanisms. If you rely on Western countries, you know, which have very little uh, to show for in terms of counterinsurgency successes, then at the end of the day, you would, you know, use the only tool that you've got in your toolbox, which is the hammer. Mm. And every problem is going to just look like a nail. Right. Mr. David Otto, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts uh, and analysis with us on this matter. Thank you. All right. That